Now, hey everybody! Uh, strange uh, Monday night for us to go right. live. It's six o'clock here in Wichita, but we're live because we have a special guest. We have a special guest, and joining us from downtown Los Angeles yes. is Pedro from the Pedro Shanahan from the Spirit Guide Society podcast. Yes, Pedro, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I co-curate the Whiskey Society here at Seven Grand Whiskey Bar in downtown Los Angeles. I help to run the Bar Jackalope, which is our little sipping library in the back room at Seven Grand. We also have Seven Grands now in San Diego, Austin, and Denver. Uh, we're a bar that opened originally in downtown Los Angeles 14 years ago. We focus on whiskey spirits, uh, and we have over 700 whiskeys in the front bar. And then uh, with um, our podcast, and the Spirit Guide Society, we do tastings where we have brand ambassadors and master distillers coming in from all over the world to share what they know about the whiskeys that they bring to market. Uh, we try to offer ourselves as an educational asset to the entire bar community and also to folks who just want to learn more about the spirits that they love. We not only do whiskey tastings, but we also do rum tastings over at Kanye, which is our rum bar right by the Staples Center, and then Las Perlas, which is our mezcal bar over on 6th and Main, all downtown Los Angeles. So now, is that is that where you're at now, or where are you joining us from? I'm in, I'm secluded in the Bar Jack Loop. We don't open until 7 p.m. here, so it's only 4 p.m. out here in L.A. right now. So I've got three hours. We can really get drunk and chat as much as you guys want. <laughs> Love it. Now, well, I have to work, so that won't work. And plus, there's all this evidence video-wise. Sure. If I get drunk, everyone's going to know. They would know. <laughs> now, we also have the Exceptional Blend, which is out here. And what do you got here? The Exceptional Malt. Don Sutcliffe kind of networked us together. Yeah. Don's awesome. We're a champion of Don's. He's a great educator. And it's a little family-run operation. And that's one of the best parts about the whiskey world to me are all the stories that go along with these bottles. You know, like even you guys, you, you're way into scotches. Like a lot of times you are in love with the scotch. You go to that little town where it's made and it's a tiny little town. Like you guys are in the booming metropolis of Wichita. But if you go up into northern Scotland, you know, uh, you could be in Blackford maybe 500 people live there and you know they've got a post office and a pub and a distillery you know what i mean mm -hmm. there's it's a it's when you talk about the importance of whiskey in in that kind of situation like that's the lifeblood of a people that's the that's the story of a town you know totally now, now we did i poured the uh, the exceptional malt this is my favorite of the three mm -hmm. bart's is the blend so he poured that one and i see don sutcliffe is tuning in as well right now Ooh, and he says good, uh, he says, hey, Scott and Bart, just saw you were on with one of my favorite guys. Pedro is great. Yes. Wow. Uh, he just says that because I'm wearing a swimsuit right now. <laughs> I'm not well, really wearing know. pants. It's really hot here in Los Angeles. <laughs> All the fires. You got to you gotta watch the clothing. That's what Bart has on, too. You got to right. get along great. Yeah, it's, it's all shirt up top, but it's it's all banana hammock down below. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Who am I? Okay. <laughs> How far are you guys from the beach there? Do you guys even that's pretty to far. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, I tend to stand out. I think it's equal distance <laughs> in any direction. <laughs> so Don's in real quick. Why don't you do a rundown of some of the folks that are in just so we can give them a shout out? Yeah, let's go back up. We had some people tuning in early. Mark Goins was here, who we, is here, and Trev Wilson, who we met down in Austin. Uh, Claire the third is tuning in. OG Brick 420 is, is sweet tea, and that's all I want. I uh, haven't seen sweet tea yet. <laughs> Pearlbert Fan Camp is tuning in. Okay, he says, Holy crap, I found a dummy's chat before it started. The stars wow. are aligned. Wow, he's in early. Steve A is tuning in. We met Steve down in Austin as well. Eric Wade is here. The sniper, um, he's out in your area out there in California. I'm not sure where he's at from Los Angeles. He'll, he'll put it in there. Um, I thought he was further north. Yeah, he's further north, I believe. Larry Fairbanks is tuning in. Um, Martin Malia. Now, when we come back, I know you got a few more. When we come back to Pedro, I want you to talk a little bit more, Pedro, about what you were telling us about Japan. Just a, a little heads up. But who else here? Oh, Ron, Carl's in. Ron's wood turning shop is here. Robot Scott. We met him down in Austin as well. Go have a real robot. Robot Scott, you yeah, bet robot you. Robot Scott. I don't new, know if robots are supposed to drink whiskey. They probably threw up their wiring or something. Like these are the new ones. Whiskey and, and 
you know, lubrication, those different kinds of lube, right? I, to- I, there's definitely, definitely different kinds. Anuj Manuja is here, Carl Van Vologem. Yes, we Larry met Carl. Fairbanks. We met Carl at the vaults uh, when we were in Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Ooh, cool. Edinburgh. Louis Sanchez is here, Whiskey Jason, Robert Promo, Christopher Malloy, Greg's Whiskey now, Guide. Now let's, well, Don's got something else. What did Don, or is that his original? That's yep, original. favorite. Okay, let's come back Here's, to Pedro. So, yep. so Pedro. Bring, bring us into the moment with that well, Japanese. I love here. what you were saying about the small, almost like, I'm going to call it almost like a pocket bar. Yeah. Yeah. Very much like that. So where I am right now, I'm in the Bar Jack Loop, which is located in the back of Seven Grand Whiskey Bar in downtown Los Angeles. This is our sipping library, but we seek to emulate the bars of Japan that are called, they call them shot bars in Japan. And and they don't mean it like a place where you take a shot. It's more uh, of a really intimate, small bar environment in which you can, you know, buy a bottle, keep it in the cabinet and sip with just a, a one friend or maybe a couple friends. Like we uh, prefer to see parties of four or less here. We only have 18 seats in the bar. Um, it's designed to be like an alternative to the kind of high volume, super fun and crazy whiskey bar out front. Back here is where you can get tasting portions and really slow down the experience and kind of dive into the whiskey education side of things. You can go really nerdy if you want to. Like we do blind comparatives or just straight comparative flights where you can like, you know, as a beginner, you could do, um, you know, international flight and try an Irish next to a scotch, next to a Japanese, next to an American whiskey and like really get into what the differences in your and your friend's palate are, you know, but in Japan, like the shop bar thing is amazing. Like these bars, sometimes they only have like eight seats and you've got a bustling Tokyo or Osaka urban environment outside but like those eight seats that is like the refuge that people seek out and it it wouldn't matter if the president of japan showed up outside to the owner operator of that little shop bar those eight people are the most important people in the world to them they they practice omotenashi in japan which is a what they consider to be the the highest form of hospitality they have a a saying in japan as ichigo ichie and it's about uh like the idea that it's this one time that we are sharing together. There's no guarantee that the three of us and these other people who are listening to this conversation are ever going to be able to do this ever again. And probably not because this is a rare little, you know, very highly technical uh, way of getting together. Uh, So we need to value this moment for what we have. It's like that presence of uh, appreciation for the moment that you do have. I love it. Yeah. Cause uh, I mean, Whenever that's one of the beauties of whiskey in general is it is it really allows you to be in the moment with the whiskey, whether you're even by yourself or with a buddy or online or with you. And it really allows you to spend kind of almost for me and for I think us to slow things down a little bit, really focus on what's in front of you. Yeah, that's right. We uh, kind of we need that in our lives more than ever now, you know, at least out here in L.A., you see you know, really crowded environments where a room full of people and they're all on their phone. They've really gotten bad at communicating with each other and instead choose to kind of focus on this ubiquitous computer that we all have in our pockets. And and while that's a beautiful, amazing thing that brings the world together with so much valuable information, it also can be uh, detrimental to the human experience in terms of actually sharing the experience with another living human in the moment. I agree. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I mean, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yep. That's that's totally it. I mean, we, we love our tech, but yeah, when, when you're actually mono a mono or whatever, engaging with someone and you're right there and you're sharing. There you go. Yeah. I a hundred percent. That is, that is, uh, that is perfect. Well, we've done a few times when we're on the, on the road or, or doing something. I've told Bart, I said, I'll be the working guy, you know, because (laughs) I mean, we're we're on YouTube. You got the social media. We're posting stuff. I go, you're in the moment. You do the talking, you know, do all that. And I'll do the business. You're a better technical guy though, too. 
Yeah. He doesn't really trust me with well, all the technical. That's true. <laughs> Who sets up all the lights? Where are you guys? Are you in, you're not in a bar right now. Are you in like your home bar? Yeah, this is our normal set uh, where we also film our show. And then we're able to just set up. We actually even filmed a couple, uh, just pre-filmed some. Uh, we always try to put something out on a Wednesday and a Saturday. So uh, we we pre-filmed a few things, got lubricated, so to speak, and then we were ready to go with you. <laughs> Good whiskey robots. That's right. So so you guys want to talk about the exceptional uh, blend, the stuff that Don puts out, which is great. Uh, you know, Don is an immense experience in the whiskey world and has used his connections to get his hands on some incredible, uh, you know, single barrels that then he releases in super small batches, uh, you know, little bottling batches. Uh, and it allows him to have, you know, a lot of control over the flavor profile, uh, expression to expression, release to release. Uh, and I, I really think it's, it's some really great stuff. Are you guys mostly focused in the Scotch world? We, we, when we, we, we've been doing reviews on YouTube for just right at right over six years now. When we yeah. first started, we were just scotch, right? And it didn't take us long, though. Within the first year, we realized, hey, we're in the states, there's all this other whiskey, there's all these bourbons, there's just Rise. so much other whiskey. I go deep out there. into rye, yeah. And mm. so, we've branched out, we've done over 700 reviews now. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I'm loving the American single malts that are coming out. Stranahan's, Westland. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I best word. Yeah, yeah, I'm. I can't wait. I'm. I'm pretty confident. I mean, I'm way outside of whoever's doing what legally, but uh, I would love to see an actual legal standard for an American single malt. Not meaning that folks still can't play and call it a a Massachusetts single malt if they want, but I would love to see that category i love barley oh yeah well and there's a lot of places like in the northwest where you've got westland and westward where their their traditional heirloom barley strains are amazing and yeah. they grow readily and like you're talking farm to table you can be buying grain and you know making whiskey and getting it in the bottle from like 20 minutes away from where the distillery is located you know 100 percent great thing uh, I'm sure out in Kansas, you guys probably grow some great barley as well. There's all kinds of great stuff. Yeah, there, there is. That. There is. A, what, well, Kansas. we probably got what Rieger is probably the one that's doing the best close, wouldn't you say? I don't we, know. Well, I don't know where they're barley and stuff. Yeah, we don't know where they're from. picking their stuff up from. But their their distillery is doing a good job. They're out of Kansas City, about uh -huh. two and a half hours away. We got a distillery in town, and they're working on some stuff. But uh, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, it's really uh, hard for the for the new guys getting into the market. When you consider yourself like how brave these producers must be to even enter into the market, because you know someone like Don, he that's a it's it comes out of his love for whiskey. That's what the exceptional blend and the exceptional grain and the exceptional malt are all about. Because he's going up against you know McAllen and Glenfiddich and Glenlivet and. Ardmore and Johnny Walkers and all these, you know, all these incredible whiskeys and blends that are like, mm -hmm. you know, to try to get shelf space next to those guys is that's a huge mountain to climb, especially, you know, when you talk about American single malts, like the whatever little distilleries there in Wichita, how are they supposed to compete with some of these like American distilleries where, you know, Jim Beam and and Wild Turkey and Heaven Hill and Buffalo Trace, those those guys could spill more whiskey down their drain than these guys could put out in a in a week, you know? You know, oh. not that they do that. They're actually really efficient at their bottling lines. <laughs> but, um, sure. Well, but I, they could. I, the thing is though, that that goes the people that are starting out those craft distilleries, you have to up your game from the start. You have to start with good grains. Mm -hmm. You good have wood. to start with good wood. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have, if you have bad grains to begin with, you're never going to make good whiskey. So if you take good grains and make good new spirit, but you put it in bad wood, you're, you're not making a good whiskey. So, I mean, it, it's all starts at the foundation, start with good grains, start with good wood, and you're going to be ahead of the pack. Well, you so, were just down an iron route. Yeah. So and that's a, that's a Texas distiller that just hit their five year, 
And we happened to meet them when we were down in Austin at a crowded barrel event. And uh, man, we loved what they were putting out. They were doing a lot of things with 100% corn, uh, their hubris, which, you know, was just, it, it made you kind of stand at attention and, and say, wow, what do you got going on here? And so Iron Root Republic's doing some great things out there in Texas. Yeah, what's interesting to me is there are a lot of um, different fermentation uh, kind of like the what you're alluding to in terms of you have to have really good grains. A lot of these American craft distillers are taking on really ambitious mash bills like doing four grain whiskeys and things like that, where um, which is a great tradition, too. But, you know, they're doing long fermentation on these heirloom quality grains, not just like you know, standard corn or what have you, but really intensely high value uh, base agricultural products. And then using proprietary yeast strains to go for a long fermentation where you get these really complex flavor profiles just coming out in your new make, in your like moonshine. It's, it's such a better quality moonshine or new make then was just available, you know, 20 years ago on the market. Put that into a barrel for 10 years and you're going to see some amazing things. Like we were supposed to have Char Bay in the Whiskey Society here tonight at Seven Grand. But because of the fires up north in California, they they couldn't leave their uh, stills this week. So, mm. Mm. but uh, yeah, they do long fermentation. When you give those uh, yeasts more time to play, they create a, a greater variance of flavor profiles in that in that base distillate. You know, you get uh, bigger fruity notes, different kinds of esters. All those things make for like really rich flavor profiles. Well, uh, and speaking, so we've talked a little bit about Seven Grand. What we haven't really talked about yet, and what brought us together is your whiskey podcast as well with the Spirit Guide Society. Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. When you got started, you know, how long you've been going, just kind of what, what that entails. Well, I helped open Seven Grand here in downtown Los Angeles 14 years ago. I was the original employee and I helped out as a with the ordering initially. You know, I was a bar back, but I would give recommends. Uh, you know, I would sit down with the different brand ambassadors and sales reps. Someone had to help figure out the wall. When we first opened, we only had like 150 whiskeys in the wall and we wanted to grow it very quickly where to where we are now, which is over 700 whiskeys on the wall. Um, but someone had to figure that out. And it was just a, you know, uh, a learning curve that we embarked upon as quickly as we could. Uh, and I also was taking in the, the order. So I would actually like sit down and read the stories on the backs of the boxes and read the pamphlets that come in the cases of whiskey and, and self-educated as best I could. And then about 11 years ago, I started uh, doing the Whiskey Society on Monday nights here at Seven Grand, where we have we invite brand ambassadors and, and master stills, et cetera, to come in and do tastings in front of a live audience. And then the last three years or two years, how long have we been doing it? Yeah. Year and a half, almost two years, uh, we've been doing a podcast where we record them and post them up. And we like to position ourselves as like an educational asset for the bartending community and also for people who just want to learn more about the spirits that they love, you know, like people, uh, consumers who want to go a little bit deeper in their exploration of the whiskey world. Perfect. Perfect. So uh, 14 years ago when you started, you didn't really know that much about whiskey. No, I knew how to get drunk. <laughs> uh, there you go. I, I, I'm, I, I have a PhD in hangovers. Uh, so early on, what was the, let's just go scotch. What was the first scotch that you were kind of like, whoa, hey, what is this? Do you have one? Well, yeah, there's, a, uh, I think one of the first single malt scotches that really blew my mind was, uh, I, I mean, I was, I was going, my learning curve was very steep. So I was, I was getting turned on uh, when I first opened the bar, I would, I would try an Irish every day, a scotch every day, uh, a world whiskey, meaning stuff not made in Ireland or Scotland or the U S and then, uh, a U.S. whiskey. And you know, that was a huge task just initially, uh, but I can remember having my mind blown by Glenn Farkless, which was a whiskey that I didn't know anything about. I'd never heard of, but uh, trying like the 105, you know, like these cast strength, single malt, sherry rich 
space side scotches, uh, mm -hmm. Blitfiddick 15, you know, like readily accessible, not allocated, pretty affordable for a 15 year old whiskey. And with just such a big, massive flavor profile, uh, the Glenlivet Nadura, uh, mm -hmm. the Ardmore 10, you know, like these whiskeys that like, you know, were essentially you're deconstructing the greatest blends in the world, but you can find these like idiosyncratic favorites that uh, that's the, the most fun part of exploring the single malt whiskey world. And when it comes to scotches, in, in my opinion, is like the variance that you can find in just one region. 100%. Scotches, you know? Yes, 100%. Mm -hmm. There's so much room to play, like you said, in even just one region. And I think because of that slower climate, and the longer lengths of time that things kind of are allowed to sit and age, you can get so many variances. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, the depth there is is astounding. Mm -hmm. And the different climes there, you know, you get a lot of uh, different methods. You know, in Scotland, they age their whiskeys very differently than the way we do things here in the States with our, like, you know, seven-story tall rack houses. Most of the stuff in Scotland are dunnage style with only maybe three barrels high, mm. you know, and it's very cool and it stays cool inside of the rack house almost year round. You know, they don't get a huge amount of, of temperature variance, which creates a totally different environment for that whiskey to breathe in and out of that barrel in where is in Kentucky. You've you got seventh story of a wild turkey rack house, that thing or a, a Jim Beam rack house. Those, they paint their rack houses black. Essentially, that's a gigantic solar oven. You go up into the top floor of those Maker's Mark rack houses, and it's 140 degrees in the height of summer, and you're getting drunk through your skin because the alcohol is <laughs> evaporating into you, you know, <laughs> doing, you know, doing your barrel selection picks. <laughs> so what, um, as far as the world of whiskey, all, all things considered, I say my favorite genre are sherried scotches. Mm -hmm. I think Mark would say peated scotches yeah, are his I'm, favorite. I'm a peat head. Wow. Where, where do you lean? Well, I, uh, I'm i a big champion of the craft distillery movement. I like to see all these new whiskeys that are coming to market, and I, I, I make a lot of mistakes, uh, meaning I, I get drunk on whiskeys that are probably not as good as I think they are. Um, in the moment, I like discover a new friend, and I'll like, get down on a bottle with a couple friends and feel really bad about it later because it often is kind of young whiskey, which gives kind of a sharp hangover, but I'm very much in love with single barrel bourbons. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that offers for the American consumer, the best bargain in the whiskey world and the most robust flavor profiles. Like when you travel around in Ireland and Scotland and in Europe, they don't drink a huge amount of bourbon. A lot of bars, you know, you'll be lucky if you can find Jack Daniels, something like that. And that's not even bourbon technically, you know, that's right. Tennessee whiskey. So actually, if you want to trigger, if you want to trigger some people, yeah, you call trigger. Jack Daniels a bourbon. Yeah, they are. Oh, they wow. right away because we're gonna this computer's gonna light itself on fire. Right. Yeah, they'll be like Lincoln County method, Lincoln County. Yeah. Jack Daniels is not a <laughs> bourbon. But there's uh single barrels to me offer the you know, in America, we like really heavily barreled whiskeys. Like in Europe and the rest of the world, it's about the base agricultural product. It's about that grass, that malted barley, or that peated malted barley. But here in America, it's all about that charred oak barrel that's being used for the first time. It's going to pull so much more barrel effect more quickly than those recycled barrels that they use in the rest of the world. Um, and to me, I, I like spicy food. I, I grew up on the West Coast. I, I, you know, here in LA, it's crazy. You can have like Ethiopian food, all kinds of food from all over Central America, the Caribbean. Uh, we have better Korean food here in LA than you can get probably in Korea sometimes. You know what I mean? It's like, it's amazing the um, kind of quality of and variance of food that you can get nowadays. And I think that that kind of, adventuresome palate is what leads to these like uh, really intense expressions like these single barrel bourbons. If you're into spicy foods and big variances, like single barrel bourbons are for you because they have such strong flavor profiles and they can be really spicy, like a, a single barrel rye. I think that's my, that's not really a category yet, but I think in four or five years, like single barrel ryes are going to be the the most exciting category in the world. They already are for me, but I just don't think people know to ask for them. 
but like a single barrel of rye whiskey to me, it's spicy. It's got huge fruity character that comes out of all those, you know, tannins in the wood. It's uh, a lot of yeah. pepper. I mean, I'll get black cracked pepper out of a oh, good, yeah. good rye. Yeah. yeah. And citrus notes and minty notes and pickle notes and there's all kinds of things. That's what's fun about it is that single barrels too, they have this beautiful temporal quality uh, case to case, like even just like something like Blanton's, which is the original single barrel bourbon that was widely distributed in America. Uh, case to case, it's going to vary slightly. You buy a bottle and you go back to your liquor store a few months later to buy another bottle and it is going to be a different whiskey because mm -hmm. it's only bottled at one barrel at a time. So that to me is the beauty of whiskey. I, I don't advocate people falling in love with the, the preciousness of whiskey, but actually just loving whiskey for what it is and, and how it's only going to be there for maybe this one time and to enjoy it on that, you know, on that merit. And, and the other thing that I advocate for is uh, finding a whiskey that you love that's affordable. Uh, and that's why I kind of side with the bourbons and the rise and the American craft distilling movement because um, it's we don't have to pay export tax. <laughs> it's just coming down the road on an 18 wheeler. So it, uh, it, it allows you to get into some really adventuresome whiskeys at an affordable price. And we, we love a lot of blind tasting as well. Yeah, well, for sure. You get rid of that name brand. You just you, you will. We'll do these 16 bottle shootout things where. You're just judging it on how it hits your palate at that moment. And uh, we've surprised ourselves many times when we're doing these big, big blind tastings. Yeah, we uh, we do. When we curate the, the wall here in the back bar at Bar Jackalope, we have our monthly workshops with our staff and we challenge each space on the whiskey wall. And you, it's all blind. That way we curate our wall without any brand bias and it, it's constantly being challenged month by month you can choose to go for any category like if you think that there's a highland malt that's better than what is currently on the wall at that same general price point you can attempt to knock it off the wall but we do it all blind hmm. i i think that that's a, a great way to like educate yourself about your own senses too and that deepening of understanding of your own senses that is a gift that keeps on giving because you talk about uh you know, when you really focus on the things that you smell and the things that you taste and you do it a lot, that changes the way you walk down the street. You know, you you ascertain the world around you in a different way. Like you smell the grass as you walk down the bike path or you can smell the flowers from further away or you notice somebody's cologne or perfume as you walk by them and you notice the smells coming out of the restaurant fronts and you know all those things become more enlightened because you practice your your ability to smell and taste it's just a muscle like anything else if you if you work those muscles out they become more active and they want to go higher in, in what they're perceiving you know and that's great because like life is short you should know more about the way you experience the universe yep we did, 100%. we did, we did a 16 bottle blind bourbon shootout Woo. and we had Blanton's in there. We yep. had uh, Van Winkle 12 year lot B. Yep. We had uh, all the, the, the shell finds you can find in any store, Maker's Mark, Elijah Craig, Woodford Reserve, um, Jim, I don't know if we had Jim Beam or not. We had Jack Daniels in there. Yeah, we threw it in. But just to make people trigger. <laughs> we went so we went through the 16 bottles blind and my favorite at the end of which, it. Which hold on, which elicited the first, I think, on air curse word that you yep. let out as well was yep. Maker's Mark. Yeah. He was like, What the hell? <laughs> Bart's Bart's favorite. Elijah Craig. Elijah Craig small batch. Oh yeah. Small oh, yeah. Batch. Not the ECBP. No. Yeah, no, it was class whiskey at an affordable base price 100 that's, that's exactly what we learned yep 100 yep. percent. and uh you can go into any liquor store pretty much and find either one yes. they're both 25 dollar range totally. and you know people are out here hunting and and searching and paying right. top dollar dollars. for bottles <laughs> dollars 12 and there's no need to right because that that um matter of fact the makers i think was in was in one of our brackets with the Elijah Craig. And I was like, wow. I mean, how are these, you know, I didn't quite, I couldn't quite figure out why they were so different. Obviously we had a weeded version in there, but it was me leaning the Elijah Craig. And when you picked 
which I didn't know it was Elijah Craig. When you picked in the makers, I was like, thank God you picked that because that was a tough bracket for me. And little did I know we were dealing with these very affordable whiskeys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even uh, if you've tried those those Maker 46 selections, yeah. the private selects that they're making, like that, that program is beautiful because you get to go in and pick from five different kinds of staves. You can put up to 10 of these French oak staves that are toasted in different variants that all have their own kind of flavor profiles. You can essentially choose your own finish for a barrel of Maker's Mark. And the possibilities there are like, that's mind blowing stuff right there. And they, they bottle it for you at cast drink. So it's coming in at like 111 proof, these crazy flavor profiles that at, at the first nosing, you might be like, I don't, is that a scotch with a lot of sherry on it? Is that a, you know, have some kind of crazy rum cast finish? Like I smell coffee. I smell fig Newtons and molasses. Like what is going on in this glass? You know, it's a, it's a really cool thing. Beautiful. Yeah. And not expensive. Again, I think that 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 makers is probably makers forty six probably running. I don't know between seventy and ninety bucks. Mm -hmm. Not too crazy. Well, that's not even. It's, it's only like forty five dollars. Some here. of the different. Yeah. But well, there you go. There's we have our our whiskey markets are very different. Like yeah, we, down here in Southern California, we get access to whiskeys that probably you guys can't get in Wichita, mm -hmm. but then vice versa. There's probably some whiskeys out there that we can't get in Southern California at all. Like, especially in terms of the craft stuff, you guys talk about distillers I've never even gotten a taste before because they have to be careful trying to sell their wares in Southern California because the worst thing that could happen is that you get really popular and then you can't meet orders. You know, that's like it happened to, it happened to Stranahan's where yeah. Stranahan's Oh, Colorado whiskey. Everybody goes crazy for it. They have the snowflake and all this stuff. And like all of a sudden they had to retreat and only sell their whiskey in Colorado <laughs> until they could build up their stores again because the rest of America was clamoring for every drop of whiskey that was coming off their stills. Totally. Yeah. I went and did their, uh, their cask thief thing. They do a snowflake, I think in November, December. No, that's July was when you was there. Well, the that's, cast well, the thief snowflake. is in July. Yeah, the snowflake is in, is in December. And the cast thief is a little, uh, 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 it's it's a, a pig roast and live bands. And you come down and they've got six different casts that you're, you're, you're sampling right off the cask with the, your Glencairn. And then you can go and purchase a bottle or two of one of the ones that you liked. And what they're doing is just awesome. <laughs> it totally is. It totally yeah. is. Yeah, that's, that's the cool thing about the craft distillery movements. And again, we got to get on the side of that temporal quality. I appreciate how small the world is as opposed to being like, oh, I can only align myself with the biggest things in the world. Like sometimes it's beautiful to have a favor that's very localized and, and very precious because of that. 100%. 100%. What do you got on some comments coming? Well, in they're all they're rolling talking yeah. about Jack Daniels and bourbon and <laughs> charcoal filtering. Yeah. Yeah. Charcoal filtration is, uh, you know, it it goes back. Someone just said that, like, I think it just said that uh, charcoal filtration was invented by aliens. Yeah. Eric, Eric Waite said that. Yeah. That's the sniper. Oh, my. Well, oh, there he's there. There he's an ancient alien astronauts. <laughs> Well, in my understanding, they were just trying to market themselves coming out of prohibition as a pure whiskey. The idea of filtration was that like, oh, it was cleaner than what you could get on the normal market, especially coming out of prohibition where there was a lot of kind of counterfeit whiskeys on the market. People wanted to know that what they were paying for was actually what it said was on the bottle, you know. Beautiful. Santa Cruz has never seen Bart so quiet. <laughs> It's because I'm talking too much. No, you're doing perfect. <laughs> we should probably drink some whiskey. Is that part of what you guys do here too? You we bet. do that. We do that. So as you're sitting here talking to us, and I know you're not drinking that much because you got to work, <laughs> but is, so you got those 700 bottles mm. over there. Are they all open to you right now? Right. Can you one, drink yeah, whatever yeah. you want? I've got 200 in the back room here. Uh, the way that the Bar Jack Club is set up is we're trying to, you know, we're a place where you can educate yourselves about the world of whiskey. So we have entry level marks and then higher end marks of every category of whiskey from around the world. And then we've got a little front bar that's the highly allocated stuff, a bunch of crazy Japanese whiskeys and limited edition releases, you know, those like distillers editions from Scotland. We have a bunch of like the, you know, 
the whistle pig weird, those little one-offs that Dave used to put out. And, sure. um, you know, it's, that's the, if you want to splurge, but really we try to become a library where it's affordable entry into the exploration of whiskeys. But I've got, yeah, 240 whiskeys back here right now that we could dip into. We've got like 23 different seven grand single barrels. We buy more single barrels of bourbon than any other bar on the West coast. I think I'm pretty sure. Really? Um, yeah. And then we split them with San Diego and then we meet up with our guys in Austin and, and Denver. We'll meet up out in Kentucky or wherever. Maybe we're going up to, you know, Hudson, New York or what have you. Um, but we buy single barrels and then uh, sell them at our bars. So every one of those expressions is only available at Seven Grand or in Bar Jack Loper so that they're bottled just for us. Love that. Yeah, it's a ton of fun. You're pouring, you're I had pouring a, what, I a had Brooke a, Lottie well, Organic? I had a bottle set to the side here. We reviewed this one a while back, and it's been here at Bart, because I have <laughs> I have my own collection at my house. Bart has his here. This is where we normally shoot at. Right. But I've been wanting to try or go back to the Brook Lottie, the Organic, 2009. Ooh, yeah. Since yeah, that's stuff. Yeah. Brook, Brook Lottie is doing some, some good stuff. And actually, we got to go. Mark Rainier used to be the uh, master distiller there. Mm -hmm. uh, he started Waterford Distillery in Ireland now, and we actually got to go over to Waterford to meet Mark and talk to him a little bit and some of his terroir um, experience and stuff he's trying to do with Waterford. But Yeah, with that Brugladi, they've got old Victorian stills there. They've got really unique setup. And before, I mean, the guy you're talking about, I believe that he trained under Jim McEwen, which is one of the most idiosyncratic whiskey makers in the world for his tenure. At, at Bruglotti, I think before he was doing, I want to say he was at Bowmore Morrison or yep, uh, I think you're right. Yep. And and then and then left and started working at Bruglotti. And there was a joke in Scotland, like he was making so many different little limited edition edition expressions that they're like, uh, yeah, it's Tuesday and Jimmy Q has got a new whiskey. You know, <laughs> actually coming out with a new expression every week. You know, that if you are into that organic 2009, you should definitely try that uh, Port Ellen 10 year, uh, Port Charlotte, Port Charlotte. Oh, yeah, we got that one. one. Yeah. It's a great one as well. Yes. Yeah, good. Definitely good things coming out. And the Octomores, um, good as well. But oh, the Octomores, yeah. great. That Black Arts, if you do you guys get the Black Arts up there in, in Kansas? Yeah, we've had yep. the 4.1 and I, the 5.1. And I tried the 3.1. My only kicker with that is the 3.1 and the 4.1 to me were phenomenal. And it's kind of dropped off for me when we hit the 5.1 and on. Hmm. But well, it's, I, that to me is those are like Christmas drams for me. You know, there's there's like a rummy quality to some of them. They have a crazy, you know, marriage of different wine cask finishes. It's it's a it's a mystery. They don't tell you what stuff they're, right. they're bearing. Um, yes. Um, to me, that's a beautiful like special holiday dram. Um, along those, I mean, we could talk a lot about. Uh, some recommends we're going in into the holiday season here. People are going to be wanting to take a nice bottle of whiskey. If you're being invited to go to someone's house for Thanksgiving, perhaps, or, uh, you know, going into someone's holiday party, uh, we could do some recommends for definitely scotches or, or good holiday buys for folks. I know that a lot of people like are constantly looking for a affordable, great pick that is going to be a crowd pleaser at their holiday party. Yeah, what, what, what I, would, would, I would, I would let me start off with that. Okay. Cause I go, if, if you're in the hundred dollar range, we just reviewed the McAllen number five okay. edition number five, which yeah. is fantastic. Yeah. Um, so if that's in, if that's the area you're looking for, I think for Christmas, that would be a great one. Okay. I wouldn't disagree with you there. there. All right. What do you have going? Cause I'm boring. <laughs> Bart would be in the $20 range. Well, no, 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 no. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I tend to go, I'm with Bart. I like to make it affordable for everybody. I don't like, I'm trying to turn people on to whiskey, and I don't think that uh, price should be a, a prohibitive part of that. Uh, I I know that for myself, the Midwinter's Dram is a fun holiday whiskey, that expression that comes out every year. Uh, and it's super small allocation, but usually not too crazy if you can get your hands on it. Um, I don't even know what the price is going to be on that. It's between 90 and 115. Yeah, it's around 90-something, right? 115. Uh, but then – 
again, I go to the single barrel bourbons. Even out there, you guys probably have liquor stores, even in Wichita, that buy single barrels, right? Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. So I would go out there and try to, you know, find a Russell's Reserve uh, single barrel that your local Elijah liquor store. Single for. barrels, I love. Say again. The Elijah Craig single barrels. Yeah, that there. stuff's mind blowing. Heaven yeah. Hill makes tons of amazing whiskey. Same thing with, uh, you know, they do the if you can get your hands on that W L Weller. Uh, a lot of single barrels are going out with that stuff. That stuff's amazing. Uh, the Four Roses single barrels, absolutely mind blowing. And they bottle most of that stuff at Cast Strength. Uh, not for beginners, but I tell you, you will turn a party on if you show up with a nice, beautiful bottle of Four Roses single barrel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, on mine, I would. So, you know, I love the Elijah Gregg barrel proof, mm -hmm. but it is so punchy and up front that oftentimes I'll just bring the, reg the regular Elijah Craig small batch yeah, you know, and I'll let people try it. And a lot of them will be like, wow. And then I'll tell them, Hey, that's 29 95 at your store and you can always get it. Yeah. And you know what, what a lot of folks I'll bring that. And then a lot of times I will bring an Ardbeg 10. I love that heavy peat. It's a yeah. standard release. I will let him try something and you know, Hey, here's here's what I think is a phenomenal bourbon, and then here's something that I'm going to warn you about before you try it. It's going to have a bit of ashtray in there. <laughs> uh, it's a delicious ashtray that I will yes. describe. You know, it's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's got some bacon going on in there too. I think or like uh, some like some umami kind of uh, boiled pork shoulder or something like that in there. There's something meaty about that art bag. Yes. Earthy and meaty. And I love it. And, and you know, when, when I'll let them know, Hey, I'm bringing a couple things that, that you're going to want to try neat and then a little bit of water, or maybe throw an ice cube in there, but you know, you can throw Coke in whatever you want, but what I'm bringing, I want you to try it a little bit different way. Yeah. And what I always find is I mean I was even at my uh, last year I was at my my wife's work event and I said hey I brought I think I brought four different whiskeys that were very different I think I had an Irish in there and I had an Elijah Craig and I had a peated can't remember what else I brought was that at the strip club <laughs> yeah her work there thanks there you go kaka uh, <laughs> and uh, but I said hey for anybody that's interested after we've had a chance to eat and and relax a little bit. I'll run a little four bottle tasting over here. And I'll usually bring some Glen Karens. And a lot of folks have never even had anything that wasn't in a rocks glass. And they've never even really been focused on the nose of a whiskey. And so I'll spend some time with that. And it's always, uh, I just, I just find it as a, a great social thing where folks kind of and it's sometimes the oddest folks that come up and say, you know, I've always been interested in whiskey, but I never knew where to start. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's why we, you know, those, those comparative tastings are so valuable, you know, for getting into what you love because everyone's palate's different, you know, like just the two of you guys have very different. It sounds like, Mm -hmm. Scott, you kind of like that more of that space side Highland style. Well, Mark's all about these like crazy peat monsters. Those are totally different flavor profiles, you know? Yes. Mm -hmm. And there's something in the world of whiskey for everyone, you know? Like uh, here in the Bar Jackalope, we like to turn people on all the time to – we have people come in every night. They're like, I don't really know anything about whiskey. I don't really think I like whiskey. But probably what they're basing that on is like a really bad decision at a college party right. in which they overdrank and now equate a very painful, nauseating hangover with their – whiskey experience but you know like there's like beautiful highland malls like the gentle dram like uh dalwini 15 for instance which is super easy yeah. entry point for single yeah. scotch or irish whiskey you know like a beautiful little you know bush mills uh even you know the green spot that kind oh, of love it. Like, yeah the glen kinchy i mean glen yeah. kinchy lowland style yes the, the lovely ladies of the lowlands as they call them that's a great place to enter into the world of whiskeys you know and even in the single barrel world when you talk about single barrels of bourbon they can vary a lot from like really intense 
complex, in-your-face, super oaky flavor profiles to very soft, sweet, fruity kind of things, you know? Well, I think you and you were talking about how people maybe overdid it in college with the whiskey, and that's why they don't like. I think also is that a lot of times they've had the cheap stuff. You know, right. it's not like they're buying the good stuff where they get the palate full of these different notes that we love yeah. from the different regions, or they experience the sherry. You know, they're buying the the half gallon plastic jug of Kentucky Deluxe. The handle. You know, <laughs> it's it's vodka with a little bit of whiskey mixed in with. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's just not good to begin with. Whiskey flavored vodka. Yeah. Or, you know, even with a scotch, they've just, they've started with a bottom shelf thing that was, you know, $17 for a half gallon of it and they didn't mm. like it. Well, and we've so, had coworkers that, that are like, oh, you guys drink scotch and they don't understand that, that I could spend an hour with an ounce and half my time is nosing it. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot to get into. Yeah. You really take your time with it for sure. Yeah, you talked about being present, being in the moment. And mm -hmm. my wife isn't into whiskeys at all. Uh, but you know, we'll be maybe watching a movie and I'll pour I'll pour something that, you know, I'll pour an ounce and think, well, this will last me an hour through the movie. And I've seen her sit there and say, Hey, I can kind of smell that. And it smells like sponge sugar and and you know, can I at least nose it? And her nose is way more sensitive than mine. And she'll just sit there and say, wow. And she's not a whiskey aficionado at all. And I think it was even, what was the Jack Daniels? Was it the barrel strength? Well, no, it was the um, the Jack Daniels. You can buy single barrels of Jack Daniels. It's mind blowing. I've got a single barrel on the wall. It was they bought it for us at 138 proof, and it is the best Jack Daniels I've ever had yeah. in my life. That being said, at 138 proof, it will knock you on your ass. You will wake up in the morning being like, "Wow, that was really fun." I don't remember what I did. Well, it was it was, it was what I call the, the single, barrel, the single, barrel, single barrel, barrel, barrel barrel proof. proof. Yeah, and I poured that, and all of a sudden she, I'm nosing it, and she's like what are you drinking? I smell like banana cream. And I was like, Oh my yeah. God, that's exactly yeah. what I'm getting. <laughs> and she ended up trying that and just, you know, I told her sip a very little bit and she was like, wow, that's amazing. And, and so I think there's such a rich experience there. Um, you know, that, that a lot of people, you know, like you're saying, it, it's not a guzzling event. It's a, it's a in the moment kind of event. Yeah. To get a chance to slow down and really investigate your own senses, you know, there's so much like, you know, they have like in the distilleries, they've got, you know, the gastrospectrochromographs, these highly incredibly technical pieces of equipment that can map out digitally the flavor profile coming off of the off of the stills. You know, they can give you a, a picture chemically of what the distill it's made up of and what it's going to taste like going into the barrel but the human nose still pulls more you know it's like they've yet to create a whiskey robot but there might be one watching here somewhere <laughs> that, that can can outdo the human nose you know because our experience is based through memories you know we have this data bank that we start putting together from the the moment that we're born, when we smell our mother's skin, you know, like we start to build on this library of scents. And so when we taste whiskeys, we're, we're going back through time, you know, we're, we're experiencing everything we've ever experienced all over again and trying to explain it, you know, using food words or, you know, smells of places or descriptions of events even or songs even or paintings to really illustrate what's going on in these glass, you know? Right. Now that's the total magic. We were in Waterford and we were with their head distiller and we were trying these smaller little tubs. They call them blood tubs, but uh, we were trying these smaller little samples and I had I one that, them blood tubs. Well, yeah, it was interesting. They've got these small, Scary. what are they like nine gallons? Mm -hmm. I know they don't use gallons, but um, the name comes from, they used to use these small casts to catch like the blood from, Pigs, I think. Pigs and sheep when they Pigs slaughter and sheep. Them. Yeah. And so the name for that size was blood tubs. But they will uh, catch, um, they've got, what, 42 different farmers, and they distill their, their, their grain from each farm separately. So they'll capture 
and preserve like a little, you know, uh, small batch, keep it on, on site to test. But I tried one of these samples from one of their, their blood tubs and it was, uh, it, it hit me with all these haze and all of a sudden, uh, exactly what you're talking about. I was transported back to like when I was six or seven, I was at my grandfather's farm in Iowa. It was his hay barn with all these, you know, rectangular hay bales and he had a rope and I was there with the cousins and I was sitting there going, I mean, I was like, like godsmacked. I was blown. I was just like, what the hell? And I was having this emotional moment mm -hmm. and the head distiller, I'm blanking on Ned. No, it was a Ned. Yeah, Ned's like, what's going on with you? And I'm like, I need a moment over here, something. And it just tapped into this smell from the hay barn from like 1976. And I was like, what the hell is going on? Yeah, your olfactory senses are, are so acute in that way. All the rest of our senses are hardwired, you know, like you don't think about your ability to touch you don't think about your ability to see. Sometimes you have to squint to read. At least I do. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to like, you know, you can cup your ears to hear better. But those things, you know, they those are all hardwired to their own centers within the brain. You know, but your ability to smell and taste that goes through the hippocampus. It has to travel through all your memories, you know. And that's how we describe things based on all the experience we've had in our entire life. So there it can be very provocative and very emotional because these things come flooding back that you didn't voluntarily enter into. It, they just suddenly pop up and that's how your brain is making sense of the moment by channeling this moment that comes from perhaps decades in the past. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it blew me away. I mean, literally I nosed it and it was like, Boom. I mean, the, the memory flashed. It totally jogged that stored memory that if if you would have asked me, I couldn't have brought it up. And uh, and that was I mean, that was just a, I mean, it wasn't even the best whiskey I tasted that day, but it just hit that memory from decades past and took me all the way back to like six or seven. And I was like, wow. I mean, it was just and I was I was just stunned. It took me a while to even recover from that. And it's amazing that that sensory experience that you get from whiskey. Do you guys use um, flavor wheels out there? Do you guys have any like favorite uh, methods of like describing flavor profiles? Things that you rely on to help spark your imagination? Now we see we've seen those, yeah. but um, we we don't. Mm -mm. Yeah. We don't. We kind of like at least I don't know about you, but I go with like. Um, when it hits me, the one thing I've learned more from trial and error is just if, if banana cream slides in, banana cream slides out. <laughs> that sounds terrible. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, what? Oh. I'm just banana saying, you know, out of your banana hammock. Is that what's happening? Yeah, I know. Now we're back to the uh, banana hammock. And, but I mean, it's banana cream. Sorry, am I approaching? Banana cream was what I got from that uh, that Jack Daniels barrel proof, single barrel barrel proof. Jack Daniels, exactly. Like you start to figure out as you do these comparative tastings, the DNA of these different distilleries. For me, Jack Daniels, I get bananas and char all the time. Like that mm. charred uh, maple wood charcoal. I, I taste the filtration, which yeah. is not a bad thing. It is the style that it is. And, and for people who want to hate on Jack Daniels, I would say like, listen, there's a reason why they're so popular the world over. They 100%. can't suck as bad as you say they do. They clearly do not suck at all because so many people love them, you know? And and why would you knock on somebody who likes a Jack and Coke? Just let the guy enjoy their – let the person enjoy their drink, you know? Life is short. We don't need to be criticizing each other's cocktails. We should all be, you know, using them as a way to get closer together, not separate each other. Uh, we got Bash and Drum Jason here. He'll never look at banana cream the same way again. <laughs> <laughs> well, Eric, Eric, on the table. Eric Waite said that's what she said when you said banana cream in, <laughs> banana cream out. That's the sniper. Yeah, I went down that road and I got lost. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Woo. Yeah, I oh, yeah, yeah. banana cream too long. Let's see. What did Dan E has something? Bart has the wheel of fortune going on is what he's got going. <laughs> well, hey, we're, coming up, uh, we're just under, we're just under the hour mark. So I think that's where we generally wrap it up. But uh, Pedro, go ahead and uh, just yeah. tell everybody again, 
uh, about Spirit Guide Society, where to find you at your podcast, YouTube channel, and everything like that. Yeah, we've got a YouTube channel, Spirit Guide Society podcast. Uh, and you can find our podcast wherever you get your podcast. We're on all the different platforms on Spotify and iTunes and all those places. What's SpiritGuideSocietyPodcast.com. SpiritGuideSocietyPodcast.com. We have over 100 episodes at, uh, out now. And like I said, for people who are like working in bars in small towns or even if you're just living in a small town where maybe you don't get to see these tastings very often where brand ambassadors are coming through or master distillers. It's a great way to deepen your knowledge of the stories of all these whiskeys. That's the best part of the world's whiskeys that each one of these bottles has a story. It has a town. It has the hand of the maker in there. There's this romance of the rack house that is unique to each one of these bottles. And, you know, it can really bring people together in a deeper way. Uh, and we'd like to turn people on to that idea. Spirit guide society podcast.com. Check it out. Oh, we have Instagram too, Spirit Guide SOC. We put up a ton of fun video content. It's not fun for me because usually I'm making an ass of myself. <laughs> no, that never happens to me. <laughs> and real quick, I'll tell you, if we're ever in Los Angeles, we'll definitely stop by. Oh, but yeah. the bar again where you're at, name that and the address for that so people would know sure. where to go. Seven Grand Whiskey Bar, and it's Seven Grand has nothing to do with 7,000. It's we're located on 7th and Grand in downtown Los Angeles. It's named for our address, 515 West 7th Street. And when we opened this bar 14 years ago, it was essentially not much happening down here. We were a part of Skid Row, and now there's been a massive resurgence in downtown Los Angeles, a revitalization, and we were kind of an anchor property for that whole movement to occur. Now they call what used to be this Part of Skid Row. Now it's the 7th Street Corridor. It's a, a bustling, vital part of Los Angeles. Cool. And yeah, you you yeah. use Seven Grand because it's easy to remember. Bart would still mess it up. Yeah. 75, like, we're 75 going, Grand is where we're headed. We're going to that 500 <laughs> bar. That You'd 500 be way in the end of the bar. <laughs> Don't listen to him. I always yeah, get it right. Like said, and you can you can go in the back room here. We've got uh, the Bar Jack Loop, like I said, which is our little Japanese style shop bar, a place to really go deep with comparative tastings and, and educate yourself on all the different styles from around the world. Mm -hmm. And we try to make it affordable for everybody. Our whole thing is to be accessible and, and to try to make the love of whiskey more accessible for everybody. We don't think it should be this elitist thing. You know, it's like always been made by farmers. It is the commerce of the old world it is, you know, when you talk about the rum world, you know, it is, it was literally the only form of money that a lot of folks have where the distillers they were, uh, you know, that they were making on their own farms, even here in America. It is, even if you were religious and didn't drink, you still made whiskey on your farm as a means to trade because you needed a way to conserve, uh, preserve, and consolidate your base agricultural products. If you've got 18 bushels of rye sitting out in your field at the end of a season, you need to do something with it. Most often, you're going to make a little beer and then distill it into whiskey because it's a lot more stable than just letting it sit out in the field, having all your work go for naught. Well, and a farmer okay. only had so much livestock and daughters that he could sell. He needed <laughs> he'd need something else. Oh my goodness. Look at that. Now who's offensive? <laughs> well, hey, Pedro, thanks for joining us. Thank you, guys. It's thanks, great to meet you. Cheers to you. Let's do it again sometime. Absolutely. That's right. Thanks so to everybody that tuned in. Cheers to all of you. Thank you so much. Check it out. SpiritGuideSocietyPodcast.com. Thank you, Scotch Test Dummies. Perfect. Cheers. I got some of that exceptional malt here yes. there Son, you go. Yes. and family he's got a beautiful family yes. it's all this market cheers so long you dummies guys. So long, guys. see you guys Ooh.